Hi, hi. Hey, Steve. Hi. I feel like I walked in on a conversation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, we have uh, Admiral John Kirby here today. He's going to give a preview of uh, German Chancellor Schultz's visit tomorrow and take any foreign policy questions you all may have. And after that, we'll continue the briefing. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, tomorrow, as you know, President Biden's going to welcome German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, here to the White House to discuss our bilateral cooperation on a range of global security and economic issues. The President looks forward, of course, to welcoming him back here to the White House where they last met February of 2022, soon after the Chancellor took office. And uh, over the last year, They've seen, together, they've seen each other on the margins of the G7 summit in Germany, at NATO, at the G20 summit, and of course they've talked on the phone regularly. They most recently spoke last week as part of the G7 leaders' call on the anniversary of Russia's invasion. The visit comes as we mark one year since that invasion started, and we're proud of the collective efforts that we've taken together to provide Ukraine with the capabilities they need. And we've worked hand in hand with Germany and the Quad, the G7, allies and partners all over the world, including through the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, <coughs> to do exactly that. We've closely coordinated our support to Ukraine throughout this conflict, including through joint announcements in January to provide infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. Germany has provided significant air defense support to Ukraine, including a Patriot battery, uh, the Iris T air defense system, which is an infrared seeking system. Uh, and five multiple, uh, multiple launch rocket systems. And as you all know, Germany is also a close NATO ally and host to our largest U.S. military force presence in Europe, which has been pivotal this year as we have again tried to reinforce our NATO allies and bolster the eastern, eastern flank of NATO and the deterrence there. A large portion of U.S. training of Ukrainian forces occurs at our bases in Germany, and our German colleagues have also conducted their own training of Ukrainians also in Germany. And just last week, we worked together to rally global support at the UN for Ukraine's resolution on a just peace. And we've also been supportive of the Chancellor's efforts to implement policy changes to respond to the changed security environment, including increasing Germany's defense spending and rapidly transitioning from Russian energy sources. I'm sure the leaders will discuss their recent engagements with Ukrainian officials, including the President's trip to Kyiv and meeting with President Zelensky, uh, as well as Chancellor Schultz's meeting with President Zelensky in Paris last month. We anticipate that the two leaders will also exchange views on the upcoming NATO summit and other global issues like the challenges posed by the People's Republic of China. All in all, uh, we expect that this will be a true working visit between these two leaders, and we're looking very much forward to, to getting some things done. We also announced uh, early this afternoon that President Biden looks forward to welcoming next week President Ursula von der Leyen of the U European Commission here to the White House on Friday, the 10th of March, another working visit. We expect their discussion to cover a range of international security challenges, of course, including support for Ukraine. They will also discuss U U.S. and EU coordination to combat the climate crisis and clean tech and take stock of the Joint Task Force on Europe's energy security that they both established uh, a year ago. Just one quick follow-up here. Uh, I think you also saw that today the President released the administration's national cybersecurity strategy. Now, this administration has taken an aggressive approach to strengthening our nation's cybersecurity since day one. Uh, and this strategy builds on the President's work over the last two years in that regard. The strategy released today will set forth a new vision for the future of cyberspace and the wider digi digital ecosystem. It will rebalance the responsibility for managing cyber risk onto those who are most able to bear it. 
including large enterprises and the federal government, and away from those who can and should not have to bear it, including local governments, tribal territories, small businesses, even individual citizens. The National Security Strategy, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, CHIPS and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and other major administration initiatives are moving the nation toward a more equitable economy, a clean energy transition, a stronger democracy, and a more competitive workforce. With the National Cybersecurity Strategy, we will protect all of these investments by increasing our collective security and systemic resilience. That strategy and the fact sheet are now available on whitehouse.gov. Hope you guys go take a look at it. John, with the Ukraine preparing for this offensive, are the two leaders going to discuss accelerating military assistance to Ukraine? I think for without question, Steve, they're going to talk about the kinds of capabilities that Ukraine continues to need in the weeks and months ahead. You'll see us tomorrow, just unilaterally, the U.S. will have another round of assistance for Ukraine coming uh, tomorrow, um, and it will include mostly uh, ammunitions and munitions that uh, the Ukrainians will need for the systems that they already have, like the HIMARS and the artillery. So I, I can't predict a, a specific outcome tomorrow. I, w I wouldn't look for that, but certainly they will be discussing uh, additional support for Ukraine going forward. We know that- Do you have a number for tomorrow's announcement? Uh, we'll just stay tuned and we'll have more detail on that later. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Just to follow on Steve a little bit, do you expect a discussion of or announcement of Germans moving tank shells or ammunition production to the United States. That's been kind of an issue that's floating out there because it's more difficult, I think, to produce in, in Europe because of regulatory and other issues. And so it, it might come here. Uh, I, we'll have a full readout of the meeting after it's over. Again, clearly they're going to talk about Ukraine and how we can all work together to help support them uh, uh, as quickly as we possibly can with as much as we can. But I don't have anything specific on that proposal. Go ahead, Thank you. Thanks, Hi, John. Um, Iran is reported to be enriching uranium up to 84% of working grade level. Um, what is your response to that? Is there any consequences for them, and how does it complicate any chances of going back to the GCPOA? And I have another question. I'm not in a position to confirm those reports. Um, uh, clearly, one of the reasons why, when this administration took office, we wanted to get back in the Iran deal was because without the Iran deal in place, uh, Iran was free to continue enrichment and free to further decrease the breakout time to weeks and months from what had been m more than a couple of years. Um, and uh, that's why we wanted to get back in the Iran deal. Um, the Iran deal right now is still not uh, a focus of the agenda. Uh, as Iran continues to supply uh, military equipment and capabilities to Russia so that they can continue to kill Ukrainians, as they continue to crack down on protesters in their own country, and as they continue to support terrorists throughout the, the Middle East and the Levant. So it's just not a focus uh, for the administration right now. After the settler, Israeli settlers attacked the village of Hawara uh, in the West Bank, next to Nablus, the uh, Israeli finance minister has, um, has called for the wipeout of this village. Uh, is this a language that's acceptable from one of your closest allies? No, it's not. And we've already talked about that. We've spoken to that. Um, that's not acceptable language. And we continue, as always, to urge both sides uh, to take no steps and certainly not to participate in rhetoric that are only going to escalate the tensions. Uh, on the Lincoln Lavrov meeting, this was obviously the first time that they've uh, spoken face to face since Russia invaded. Why did the U.S. feel now was the right time to have this conversation? And also, the Russians say that it was at Lincoln's request. Is that correct? It was a pull aside. They were in the same room at the G20 in uh, New Delhi, um, and Secretary Blinken took uh, the opportunity available to him to uh, to make three key points. One, we want we don't want Russia to suspend their participation in New START because that treaty makes both our countries safer. Two, we want Paul Whelan back. We got a proposal on the table. They ought to take it. And three, we're going to continue to support Ukraine. Uh, China, would, though, was not on that list. Is there a reason why it, it was a 10-minute pull aside? It wasn't a pre-scheduled, long, bilat kind of a meeting. I mean, it was it was an opportunity that Secretary Blinken took advantage of. To follow up uh, on a couple of the topics on that, in that neighborhood, any evidence that China has been any, made any further decisions or actions either way, whether to provide lethal aid to Russia? We've seen no indication that they've made that decision. They haven't taken it off the table, Peter, but we haven't seen any indication. As it was then. Let me ask that if I can. The president said to us a couple of weeks ago when he was speaking about the aerial objects there that he expected to speak soon was his language with the president 
She, is there any update on that? Any formal outreach? When would that take place? Not, no formal outreach uh, that I'm aware of, uh, Peter, and no call on the schedule. Okay, then just one last one to punctuate. Several months ago, the president promised Saudi Arabia would suffer, quote, consequences. That was his language after the Saudi-led OPEC, unex uh, OPEC unexpectedly announced it would cut production. Is it fair to say now this many months later that that's not going to happen? Uh, I addressed this the other day when I was at the podium here with uh, Karina a few days ago. We talked about this. Um, um, there's, f first of all, there there already had been consequences because, as you know, Congress took action to limit arms sales uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, but uh, we noted uh, on Monday, uh, whenever it was that I talked to you about last, that uh, that they had visited Key. They agreed to contribute uh, $400 million of energy infrastructure support uh, to uh, to Kiev, to Ukraine. We found that a welcome development. Uh, we're focused on the future now. Yeah, Thanks, Karen. Um, John, I have a question on the cybersecurity strategy, but first on on Taiwan, the administration has approved a $690 million potential arms sales to uh, Taiwan that includes hundreds of missiles, including for F-16s. Can you clarify the administration's goals uh, to provide these weapons? And can you address concerns whether you'll be able to fulfill this package, considering the U.S. defense industry is already struggling to fulfill munitions requests for Ukraine? Um, I don't know that there's anything to clarify. I mean, this uh, this most recent announcement on arms sales is very much in keeping with uh, our responsibilities under the Taiwan Relations Act to make sure that Taiwan has sufficient self-defense capability. Uh, these munitions designed for F-16 aircraft will exactly help do that. And as for the impact of it on what we're providing to Ukraine, there, there won't be. They're, they're completely two different systems, the way this is. I mean, arms sales is a whole different process and methodology than what we're doing for Ukraine, which is largely through presidential drawdown authority, where you're basically taking stuff that are already, that are already on your shelves and, and providing it to Ukraine directly. So it's a completely different process, different system altogether. So is it the same, is it the, the same kind of munitions, but just provided by different factories? I'm sorry, I don't understand. The, the, the types of, I don't want to get into too much detail here from the podium, but the types of munitions are the kinds of munitions that uh, will allow uh, Taiwan to continue to modernize their fleet of F-16s. So it's largely designed for F-16 delivery. Okay, and on cybersecurity, um, would the new cybersecurity strategy allow the administration to authorize U.S. agencies to implement hackback operations uh, to networks of criminals or foreign uh, governments to preempt uh, attacks on U.S. networks? I don't think we're going to get into the tactics here from the podium on something like cybersecurity. I mean, I'd encourage you to take a look at the strategy. It's pretty fulsome. Uh, it covers a, a wide range of issues, largely bringing back onto the federal government some more responsibility that we think is more appropriately us and that shouldn't be laid at the feet of small businesses and individuals, uh, as well as uh, the tribal territories, um, and also gives us um, more tools and more flexibilities with going after bad actors, and I think I really do need to leave it at that. Hey, John. Um, I'll in my front meeting. Is there any discussion or uh, consideration of what it would take for a conversation between the president and, uh, and President Putin? Is that off, off the oh, table? The, pres the president already spoke to this several months ago, I think, when uh, President Zelensky was here. He said if Mr. Putin were to be sincere and, and, uh, and dedicated to actually Sitting down and talking about peace, the president would consider talking to him, but there's been no change to that. And back on Ukraine, um, the, the Russian government in the last uh, 24, 48 hours has been uh, putting, publishing reports about uh, alleged Ukrainian saboteurs in its territory and fighting with them. Is there any U.S. government assessment of, of that, of the veracity of those claims? Seeing the reports, can't confirm them. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, one other question on the visit of Chancellor Scholz. Um, According to my excellent colleagues from Reuters, the administration is, you know, consulting with allies regarding further sanctions against China if China decides to deliver weapons to Russia. And Germany comes to mind, given their very close, uh, you know, business relationship with China. So do you expect that to be a topic and maybe a difficult topic in the conversation tomorrow? I, I certainly would expect in the context of talking about what's going on in Ukraine that uh, that the issue of, of uh, third-party support to Russia could, could come up. Uh, they have reached out, as you know, to Iran. They've reached out to North Korea. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of where we are here. We haven't seen the Chinese make this decision. Uh, we don't think they've taken it off the table, but we haven't seen them make a decision to go forward. We've communicated 
privately, certainly publicly, our concerns about that. We believe it would uh, it's not in China's best interest uh, to move forward in that regard, and they should see it the same way. I just don't think it's helpful right now to hypothesize about what uh, you know what consequences might result. Secretary Blinken has talked about the fact that there would be uh, ramifications, and I think that's probably better if we just leave it at that. Thank you so much, Karine. Hi, John. Um, so President Zelensky just spoke with Lula now, and he just tweeted that uh, they discussed diplomatic efforts to bring peace to Ukraine, Ukraine, and he invited Lula to come and visit Ukraine. Do you believe that any efforts to mediate peace at this time could be successful? It, only if President Zelensky is, uh, and his government are fully brought into the process and fully supportive of it. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about refugee policy um, as well. The president often, uh, uh, the president was uh, praised Poland for assisting refugees during his trip. Uh, when it comes to the United States, we often hear about the United for Ukraine program. There was also for uh, between April 11th and April 21st about 10,000 Ukrainians who came in across the border were not covered by TPS or United for Ukraine, but parole that's set to expire next month. Is the administration considering, uh, I don't know, any option for uh, to extend that legal status? And if it's not extended, what would happen to those 10,000 Ukrainians in the United States? Let me take the question. I'll take that question. We'll get back to you. Is there any chance that we could get you uh, in the White House to reconsider not having a 2 plus 2 press conference with Schultz? Um, we would love for there to be the regular 2 plus 2 press conference. Similarly, are you planning to hold one of these press conferences uh, when President von der Leyen visits? Uh, so I think Corrine addressed this uh, issue uh, yesterday. Uh, I don't have anything to add to, to what she told you. This is a working visit, um, and it's very the agenda which is tight-knit because it's just not an expansive, he's not going to be meeting with the president all day. It's a, it's a, it's a tight visit, working level visit um, on, uh, on pretty significant issues, and it just wasn't part of the schedule for either leader here to do a, to a press conference. And it's not, as I understand it, I've not been here for long, but we don't always do that. I mean, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. It depends a lot on the agenda and the, uh, and the, the schedules by both leaders. Thank you very much. Uh, Hungary has further delayed uh, a vote on ratifying Sweden's and Finland, Finland's uh, accession to NATO, yeah. this time by two weeks. Uh, are you concerned about this delay? Are you confident that uh, Hungary uh, at the end will uh, accept uh, expansion of NATO? And since Turkey says it's not ready to approve Sweden's membership, uh, in NATO, would President Biden support Finland's admission first before Sweden's? And one question on yesterday's meeting between. Hang on, before you go to that, because I'm going to forget. So, first of all, what we are confident in is that Finland and Sweden are going to be great NATO allies. Two modern militaries, we know them well, we operate and train with them all the time. There are going to be welcome additions to the alliance. The president remains confident that they're going to be NATO allies. Now, we're also uh, encouraged by the, the fact that there are still discussions going on between Turkey, Finland, and Sweden, as well as uh, uh, with Hungary. Uh, we'll let those nations speak to uh, the specifics of their concerns and, and the process. But the president's confident that these two countries deserve to be in NATO and will be in NATO. Um, and as for your second question on the choreography, what matters to us is that both nations become NATO allies. The Texas two-step that goes into doing that, that's, that's, not, that's not our main concern. The second question, I'm not sure if it's uh, to you or to Karin. Uh, the First Lady, Jill Biden, met with uh, Poland's First Lady, Agata Kornhauser Duda, yesterday at the White House. Uh, could you give some details about the meeting? Uh, how it happened? <laughs> Um, no, it was a terrific opportunity for the First Lady to meet with the First Lady of Poland uh, and to be able to thank her personally um, for all the support that Poland has given to our men and women in uniform uh, who are uh, operating out of Poland right now, as well as the just incredible humanitarian work that Poland has done for Ukrainian citizens. I think we've talked about this, but essentially they have all the rights of 
Polish citizens. Their kids can go to school, they can get jobs, they can qualify for health care, and they're living in homes. Polish homes, families are taking them in. Uh, we're talking about more than a million and a half refugees. Now, that's the kind of generosity that the Polish people are demonstrating, and it was really important to the First Lady to be able to, to thank the First Lady of Poland directly on that. Thanks, John. So a bill requiring the DNI to declassify the COVID origins intel passed the Senate. If it passes the House, too, would President Biden sign it? I won't get ahead of the President's decision-making, um, uh, Peter, but uh, look, we, a couple of things to keep in mind. Right after taking office, the President declassified uh, and, had, and made public the DNI's uh, initial findings here about the source of, of COVID. So he already very swiftly and unilaterally put information out there. That's one. Two, the intelligence community continues to assess the origins of COVID. I know I've seen press reporting about some preliminary findings that, of a classified nature, but there's still no consensus. Um, and that's why the president has directed the team to stay at the work, because he wants to know. He wants to know as best we can know what the origins were so that we can work to better prevent a future pandemic. But we've got the FBI director saying, most likely a potential lab incident in Wuhan. If, if a foreign country came to the United States and killed 1.1 million Americans with guns, would the president just let that slide? Nobody's letting anything slide. That's why the president wants the intelligence community to work so hard to, to get to, hopefully, to get some, to some answers that, uh, that we can rely on. Right now, there's just no consensus. Um, I, I, it's hard to take a look at what the president has done here in terms of declassifying and making public information already, in terms of the constant and consistent briefings to members of Congress in a classified and unclassified setting uh, in just recent weeks on what the origins of COVID were and on his tasking again to the intelligence community to keep at that work and come away from that thinking that he's not taking this seriously. Okay, three more, okay. Uh, as many as 900 schoolgirls appear to have been poisoned in Iran, does the U.S. have any information about what could be behind those poisonings? And if it was the government is that something that could pr prompt American sanctions? It's uh, deeply concerning news uh, coming out of Iran. Uh, these, uh, uh, what, what could be the poisoning of, of young girls that are just going to school. And truth is, we don't know right now uh, what caused those ailments. Uh, we see reports that the Iranian government are investigating it. That's the right course of action. We want those investigations to be thorough and complete, and we want them to be transparent. Little girls going to school should only have to worry about learning. They shouldn't have to worry about their own physical safety. But we just don't know enough right now. Would the U.S. take the, that investigation at face value, or would you try and conduct let's your just own? See, let's, let's, let's see what the results are here first before we make some kind of snap judgment. We don't really know what's going on with respect to these hundreds of, uh, of schoolgirls. Um, and uh, we, I think where the president is, we need to know. The world needs to know. Certainly the families of those little girls need to know. So let's, let's see where it goes before we make some snap judgments. But obviously very deeply concerning reports. Uh, I'm Paul Whalen. Uh, was there any progress made in the conversation between Lavrov and Secretary Blinken that they signaled any willingness to release him? It was a short conversation uh, where the Secretary uh, had an opportunity to remind Ms. Minister Lavrov, we want Mr. <laughs> Whalen back. He belongs with his family. Um, and that there is a proposal on the table. We want the Russians to take it. I really, for reasons I'm sure you can understand, I don't want to get into what the back and forth it, uh, was on that or detail the conversations that uh, we're still trying to have with the Russians about getting Mr. Whalen back. Just briefly on um, Ukraine aid, um, do we expect anything on that in the budget next week? Or will that just be top lines on defense? Like, I'm not going to get ahead of the president's budget announcement. Thank you, John. Uh, China and Belarus uh, conducted high-level talks yesterday and uh, expanded their defense partnership. Is the White House concerned that China may channel weapons to Russia uh, via Belarus? Again, we have not seen the Chinese make a decision with respect to providing lethal weaponry. Uh, we don't believe they've taken it off the table, but we don't believe they've made a decision to do that. So I really don't think it's helpful to get ahead of where we are here uh, in this process. We've communicated that the Chinese are concerned about this. It's really not in their best interest, and they should believe the same thing. Um, so let's let's just not get ahead of where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, thank you, John. I have two questions. What is the President Biden's uh, reactions 
about North Korea recently uh, Pasong 15 ICBM launching and a uh, large rocket launchers. Do you have any comment on that? We have reacted in real time to each and every one, Janie. I think you know that. And uh, in uh, in response to the most recent ones, uh, we conducted some, some uh, exercises with uh, our ROK uh, allies. Uh, we're continuing to stay vigilant on and around the peninsula. Um, and of course, we've publicly condemned these launches, as had uh, our UN uh, colleagues. And uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine requested uh, arms aid from South Korea. Does the United States want South Korea to provide weapons other than ammunition to Ukraine? We want all nations to support Ukraine to the best that they can. Uh, and we don't want any nation to help Russia kill more Ukrainians. But it's a sovereign decision. Each nation has to decide. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm like, no, no, no. no. I, uh, we, now you made, I no, forgot I'm my sorry. train of thought. These are sovereign decisions, and we want every nation to act uh, uh, in accordance with what, what they believe they can handle from their own national security perspective. Uh, the South Koreans have already been very helpful. They've been attending these Ukraine conduct defense groups, um, and we appreciate, we appreciate that, and we're very grateful for that. Rhythm, but so, not, no, I, no, I, I haven't got much rhythm today. <laughs> so, John, given what you were saying earlier that the administration doesn't think China's taken off the table sending weapons to Russia, and but you haven't seen any movement towards doing that, how serious then do you think China is about sending weapons to Russia? Difficult to know, Carol. We, we, we actually don't know the answer to that question. Certainly we were concerned enough to bring it up privately with our Chinese counterparts and publicly with all of you and the vice president speaking to it in, in Munich. Um, we, took it, we took that seriously. Uh, but what their next step is or, and what's going to affect that, really that's a, a question only they can answer. The president's strong belief, and he said this himself, is that this is not a move that would be in the best interest of the Chinese and their standing in the international community, which we know you know, they highly prize. Um, more critically, we don't believe that they should see it as being in their best interest. But it sounds like, from what you're saying, that you don't want to lean into the idea of threatening sanctions. Is that because you don't think that they will ultimately move in that direction? I'm just trying to get a sense of why there seems to be a little bit of a hesitancy to talk in detail about how the U.S. could sanction China. Secretary Blinken has been clear that, that, that there will be consequences, and he mentioned that sanctions could be uh, one of those consequences. Um, so I mean, we've, we've laid out that, you know, that there are tools available to not only the United States, but to our, our uh, allies and partners should, should China move in that direction. But you know, ultimately, it's their choice to make, and we really strongly urge them to make the right choice here. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Okay, I have one thing at the top and then we'll get going. I just wanted to follow up on yesterday's good news from Eli Lilly, uh, heeding the president's call for companies to lower their prices and cap their insulin costs at $35. Data today shows that Americans in all 50 states, especially in communities of color, will benefit from the president's cost cutting actions. Through the Inflation Reduction Act, close to 4 million sectors, that's, pardon me, seniors on Medicare <laughs> with diabetes are protected. Seniors started to see their insulin costs capped at $35 per month this past January, saving some seniors hundreds of dollars uh, this past, uh, hundreds of dollars for a monthly supply uh, this past January, combined with Eli Lilly's announcement, which is the largest insulin manufacturer. We're making serious progress to cut insulin costs for approximately 26 million Americans living with diabetes. The data today uh, shows that these cost living measures will also disproportionately impact communities of color as black, Hispanic, and American Indian, Alaska Native adults have higher rates of diabetes in the United States than whites, white Americans. And of course, this, is, this also builds on the tireless work 
the president has done to lower health care costs for Americans and <laughs> call on uh, that that call on in that call uh, that was heated in North Carolina, where they announced an agreement uh, to expand Medicaid today. The president has been calling for all remaining states to expand Medicaid programs, and today North Carolina became the 40th state to answer that call. Expanding Medicaid improves quality of life for Americans, and we thank Governor Cooper and bipartisan work in North Carolina legis legislature to expand access to quality health care. Uh, we are excited to see the state move quickly to get half a million North Carolinians covered, which is incredibly important. Zeke, before I go to you, I forgot to tell people to welcome back and congratulations on being a dad. And how's baby Kareen doing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had like this delayed reaction. It's, I, I do have a lot of hard questions for her when I get home. Oh. <laughs> are they hard or are, you, are they seriously hard? Or? <laughs> I don't want to say the next word that I want to say to that. Okay. I'm Thank you. Zeke. The floor is yours. Thanks, great. Uh, welcome back, Peter. Um, uh, President just tweeted a couple of minutes, maybe two minutes ago regarding the D.C. Home Rule, saying he would sign the resolutions that they should have the Senate to overturn the, the changes to D.C.'s criminal code. Uh, the President has spoken a bit about his support for D.C. State in the past. But, you know, why does he believe that he uh, should step in where the D.C. where the, the residents of D.C.'s elected representatives you know, pass these changes? Uh, why does he believe that his, he should substitute his wisdom and judgment for theirs? So look, I mean, just to double down and triple down on what the president has said for decades, which is that uh, he believes every every city uh, should have their the right to self government. <clears throat> that is still is the same case that hasn't uh, that hasn't changed anything. He <clears throat> has long believed that D.C. statehood uh, should be uh, something that the residents of D.C. should be allowed. Uh, again, that hasn't changed. But this is different. The way that we see this is uh, it's very different. This is uh, the D.C. Council put changes forward over the mayor's objections, and the president doesn't support changes like lowering penalties for carjacking. So this piece is different. But again, it doesn't change the administration strongly supporting H.R. 50 uh, which would have made uh, D.C. the 51st state. Uh, that is something that he still very much uh, supports. Uh, and we're going to continue to call on, on Congress uh, to provide a swift and orderly transition to statehood for the uh, people who live here in, in D.C. I think you explain a little bit why this is different, but just because it's different. The president believes that every city should have the right to self-government, except if he, believe, if he disagrees with their, the outcomes of their, of their governing I, process. Look, one thing that the president believes in is say, making sure that the streets in America and communities Communities across the country are safe. That includes DC. That does not change. That's why he puts forward a historic piece, uh, a historical plan uh, that uh, he hopes uh, Republicans in Congress would support, uh, which is his Safer uh, America plan. That is something that the president has led. When you think about uh, keeping communities safe, when you think about uh, uh, making sure that uh, we're also uh, protecting our law enforcement and making sure that uh, we have law enforcement in communities that continue to keep uh, communities safe, that's something that he has has led on. So when it comes to what this proposal brings forth, uh, which is, you know, really uh, lowering penalties for carjacking, that's not going to, he doesn't believe that's going to keep our community safe. So the if the bill comes, uh, he's going to take action, as he said. Just another step, because this, this the principle matter, the president's making a principled statement that he supports City I think two. I think those two things. Those two. Those two things can both. Two things could exist at the same time, right? We've heard that throughout our lives, right? When we hear, uh, when we hear uh, things that we may not disagree, we may not agree with, that they both could exist at the same time. Which is, the president still thinks that uh, D.C. should become uh, the 51st state. That is something that he has supported for decades, not just these last couple of years. But there is, he feels, as president, he has the obligation as well to keep America's cities safe, to keep communities safe. And this is one step in, in a way to do that. That's it. Go ahead, Justin. Sorry, I just want to look back on that really quickly. Yeah. So is the principle here that the president believes in self-rule and autonomy, except if he believes that D.C. is passing laws that would leave its residents unsafe I think, in some I don't way? Think, I don't think it's every piece of legislation, this is going to come to his desk, and he has a decision to make for the people of D.C., right? He has, he actually has a decision that is going to be put in front of him well, on... Decision. Now yeah. it's a precedent that he's setting. I, you know, in the in yeah. the SAP that you guys issued, it said Congress should respect the district's 
autonomy to govern their local affairs for too long. Washington residents have been deprived full representation and the principle of taxation without representation. It, there is obviously a, a sort of immediate question about whether these changes done by the DC Council are smart or good policy, but there's also a principle about when the president would intervene to overrule the elected representatives. I, I get the I get the question, Justin. I really do. And what I'm saying to you is that the president supports DC statehood. That has not changed. That is something that he has supported for the past two decades or more. Uh, certainly, he's he was very clear about that during the campaign. We've been very clear about that the last two years. The president is being put. This piece of legislation is being put forward to him. That's going to become law, clearly, right? Once he signs it, and it's a decision that he gets to make, right? To protect communities, to protect communities across the country, uh, and this is a way that he believes that he can do that. He believes by 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 signing in this into law, uh, that it will protect communities. And so that matters. That matters. We, you all were asking me. More than the, the no, I'm saying, I'm saying both things can exist at the same time. I'm you can't. I'm sure that they can. Okay. <laughs> no. If I'm, if I'm being no, honest, either no, no. you can make decisions for yourself, or I will make decisions for you. But he's, I in he, your best he, what, the decision that he is making, he's making, he's making it for the people of DC. Right? When By making sure. That, he yeah, but no, I understand that. But he, this is being presented to him, right? This is a, being presented to him on signing this into law. And if you look at what is being presented to him, the mayor actually disagreed with what the DC Council put, put forward. And so now this is an opportunity to protect the community. That's the way the president sees this, to protect the community. Okay, I, I wanted to ask about the Willow Project. Um, can you? Talk to some of it, uh, kind of detail the extent to which the White House has been involved in deliberations about this project at this point, and um, is it accurate the reporting that White House officials have been telling folks that they're looking at banning drilling elsewhere uh, in exchange for uh, offering approval of at least part of this project? So I don't have anything to share on that. That's a decision that's going to be made uh, by the Secretary of Interior. That's for her to decide. I'm just not going to so the get it. Is not involved. Uh, I'm just I'm just not going to. I would refer you to a decision that is made by the Department of Interior. That's her decision to make. Good. Could you tell those a little bit more about what the president talked about at the lunch? Did they talk about the debt ceiling? Did they come up with any legislation they want to get done this year? Um, so as as you all know, the president went uh, went over to the Capitol, uh, met with the Senate uh, Democratic Caucus. Uh, folks that he has known for for many times and have worked we've worked really closely with them over the past two years on delivering historic pieces of legislation that's going to uh, really continue to grow the economy and uh, build an economy as the president has said many times from the bottom up middle out uh, so that they talked on about an array of issues important critical uh, issues that matter to uh, the American people uh, debt ceiling as you know is always something that's at, at the forefront especially as what we're seeing uh, House Republicans are trying to do trying to hold our economy ho hostage and we've been very clear. We're not going to negotiate on the debt ceiling because this is something that is a constitutional duty uh, that uh, Congress has, and they need to move forward and lift the debt ceiling. That is something that is not negotiable, uh, and we've been very clear about that. The president next week is going to put forward his budget on March 9th. He's going to lay out uh, how he sees uh, it, how he sees his responsibility to be fiscally uh, responsible, if you will, and uh, we'll see that from the president. Now, the president has also said if there is a real conversation that uh, congressional members want to have uh, about how we continue to uh, lower the the, uh, the deficit, that's something that he's willing to do, which he has uh, actually done over the past two years, $1.7 trillion. You heard him say during the State of the Union uh, that uh, his plan is going to uh, uh, who's going to lower the deficit by another uh, two trillion dollars. So uh, I'll leave it there uh, as to their, their what has been clearly important uh, to the American people and what has been discussed. Yeah, just back to the crime bill. If the president was planning to sign it, why did the administration put out that statement saying that it opposed it? So look, I, I want to be very clear about this, and I think I have. Uh, look, the president does not support the DC uh, Council, the changes that they, uh, that they uh, put forward over the mayor's objections. And those changes like lowering penalties for carjackings, uh, he thought uh, was, uh, was unacceptable. 
And so he wanted to make sure that, again, we're keeping uh, communities safe. And this is, he believes, uh, you know, the D.C. community deserves that. They deserve to feel like as if they are going to be safe. Uh, and uh, we've talked about, just last week, we talked about how the president inherited uh, increase in, in crime uh, when he walked in into this administration. And this is a president who has led on that, who has led on making sure uh, that we keep uh, that we put forward public safety and law enforcement policies to make sure that we keep our community safe. And so he's done that through the American Rescue Plan, uh, and he's uh, he did that with his Safer American Plan. Uh, again, you know, Republicans have refused to fund this plan. Uh, and so he's going to continue to make sure that he puts Americans first. And that's how he's seeing this 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 particular piece of legislation that's going to come before him. And can I ask about a moment in the president's speech last <laughs> night in Baltimore? Uh, he was talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene, and he mentioned a mother that had lost two of her sons to fentanyl. He said the interesting thing is that the fentanyl they took came during the last administration, and then he seems to laugh. Um, the mother's demanding an apology, and I'm wondering if he regretted how that came out. So, you know, I want to be very careful here because this involves uh, a mom, as you just stated, who lost two sons. And when it comes to this president, I believe the American people knows who he is fundamentally because he's been around for some time, and they have watched him go through grief. They have watched him deal with really personal loss. And um, so, this is a president that understands that. Uh, he expressed sympathy for her last night, um, and uh, his heart goes out to uh, any person, any person who has to go through that type of uh, trauma, that type of hurt. Uh, I will say uh, his words are, are being mischaracterized uh, by, uh, by someone who is regularly discredited um, for, uh, for things that she says that are really conspiracy theories. And those lies are being parroted by a certain network. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, and, uh, it, you know I'll, I'll just leave it there. I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing, is that uh, conservative parents on fentanyl, of fentanyl victims have been very clear. They have blasted uh, uh, the Congresswoman for these dishonest kinds of statements and kinds of attacks. Uh, but again, our hearts go out to anyone who loses, uh, who loses a person that they love. And this is something that you've heard from this president uh, over and over again when, when that has occurred and has been presented to him. Yeah. Retired U.S. Army Colonel Paris Davis is receiving the Medal of Honor tomorrow, which is nearly 60 years after his commanding officer first recommended that he get it. The paperwork for his recommendation disappeared at least twice. Does the White House think it breaks from the factor in why this honor took so long? So we were going to have some some information to share with you on the Medal of Honor uh, recipients. We'll have more. We'll have that tomorrow. So we will go through um, who's going to be getting the Medal of Honor. I don't have anything to share specifically on anyone at this time. I just don't want to get ahead of the team. But I'm, I'm happy to answer that question tomorrow once we have more information to share. I could also ask an immigration question. The governors of Indiana and Utah have proposed that states be allowed to sponsor immigrants. Uh, what types of jobs that they need to fill? Is this something that the president? Would be interested in exploring with them. I don't have any uh, any policy um, uh, policy preview to share from here or any um, reaction to that at this time. Go ahead, Peter. I just want to follow up on Kevin's first question about the DC crime law again. Just to be clear, the White House put out a statement saying that the president did not support it, but now from the podium you're saying that well, not, the president as well, right? The not just yeah, me. Right. Fine. Yep. You the podium. You represent the president, but fine. To be clear, no, but you heard directly from the president. I just want to make so sure that so that, that is that is clear. Statement. Even better, makes it even better. That, for me. Right? So That's why what I'm saying it makes it even better. You heard it directly from the president. I'll ask you cleanly. Why would the White House say he does not support it, and then he would say he is not vetoing it? Instead, he is signing it. Which is to say, why should Americans believe the White House when it says it doesn't support something if the president's going to sign it no less? I understand the question, Peter. I'm just telling you at this moment where we are currently uh, with this uh, piece of legislation that is going to be coming, this pr that's coming from the Senate, that's going to be coming to the President's desk, uh, he, he will sign it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is because what is different about this, uh, signing it, is it, as I mentioned before, uh, the D.C. Council put forward was put forward over the mayor's objections, and the president wants to make sure that communities 
even in D.C., the Americans in D.C. feel safe. So let me get to the second half of that question, which is, why should Americans believe the White House when it says it doesn't support something when the president's going to sign it no less? I think what the, the American people, who I just mentioned to, to, uh, uh, to one of your colleagues, I think the American people know who Joe Biden is. I think they fundamentally, hold on, let me, uh, wait, <laughs> you've got, you have your eyebrows moving and leading in, so I just want to make sure you give me a second to answer. I know, I'm just uh, you have this, this, you get, you get really excited, Peter, so I just want to make sure. I, make sure I know. Oh, my gosh. They're so exciting. Thrilling, thrilling. No, but with all seriousness, look, the, the American people know who Joe Biden is. He's been around for some time, right? Uh, they fundamentally know who he is as a person. The president, especially these last two years, have always, always put the American people first. And that's what they should know. That's what they should take away, that he's putting, uh, in this case, the safety of, uh, of the people of D.C. first, and he is always going to do that. Let me ask you one separate question, sure. if I can, then I apologize. Thanks for letting me follow up. The president, yesterday from the podium, you said that there was no other plan. The president was focused on the plan that exists as it relates to student loan forgiveness. Right now, before the Supreme Court, the president told us on the lawn yesterday, uh, we're confident, we're on the right side of the law, but not confident about the outcome of the decision yet. So, because the president himself said that he is not confident of the outcome of the decision, what is the White House doing, or why is the White House not preparing a plan B to help those who have student loans know what they need to do to prepare themselves if it's rejected by the court? Because we're confident in our legal authority. Well, he just said he's not confident in the outcome, though, so because, it doesn't matter if you're who, confident but, in your authority. But of course, who would know how the Supreme Court is going to go? No one knows how the Supreme Court is going we have to a rule. Good sense because it's a 6 3 conservative lean right now. But it doesn't mean that we can't be confident in the merit, in our standing, and we are. We're so confident. We're have faith because of the. I'm just, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're going to have faith that that your argument is the one they that the law supports, even if you don't think they will support it and not make an alternative plan. What I'm saying is, and that the president uh, does not know how the Supreme Court will rule. That's of course we do not. We never know in any case how the Supreme Court is going to rule. What we are saying is that the Solicitor General did an amazing job, we believe, in in really uh, defending the program that the president has put forth. So and he laid. But you see, you, you see why? I, no, I let me let me finish. <laughs> no, let me let me finish. Let me finish. This is why I was saying earlier because you tend. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what? <laughs> What this, what the SG made very clear yesterday, and we believe this, uh, and actually spoke to the president about this this morning, is that our opponents don't have the standing or the merits on their argument. That is, that is because she put forth such a forceful, uh, forceful argument uh, for the president's plan. I guess I'm asking because we're hearing from those who have student loans right now who are wondering if this is rejected. They have to make a plan B. So simply put, what is the message to those Americans who have loans right now? Because whether or not the White House thinks it's going to get through the court, it may not. What should they be doing actively right now, or what can they anticipate from you on their behalf? So here's what they can anticipate from us on our behalf. And they and many of those millions of borrowers received an email from uh, the Secretary of Education yesterday, basically stating that we have their backs. So we are going to continue to fight. For two months, right? You would extend it for two months. We're going to, well, there's, there's two parts to that, right? We're going to extend it for two months depending on the decision, right? That will be two months after the decision, or January 30th, right? So that is what we've put up. I'm, I'm so sorry, June 30th, yeah. you're correct. Um, but our message is, to your other question uh, that you asked, is that we're going to have their backs. We are going to continue to have their backs, as the president has had the backs of Americans, whether you're in a red state, blue state, rural America, uh, urban America, we will have your backs and continue to make sure that we fight for you so that you are not left behind. And that is what this plan is. Indulging me. I, I, well, good boy, sorry. You've been in a lot of indulgement. Oh, boy. All right, Ed. Just, Go ahead, Ed. Just three, actually. <laughs> uh, would, there is a, a, a separate House Republican, Congressional Republican proposal that would override legislation allowing non-citizens to vote in Washington, D.C. elections. If that passes the Congress, would the President sign it? I can say uh, that the President does not support that. The reversal here comes in the wake of a handful of senators facing re-election in 2024 saying that they were seriously considering supporting this legislation or had planned to vote for it. 
Joe Manchin, John Tester, Bob Casey, Angus King. Some might look at this and say the president is choosing to give political air cover to vulnerable Democrats in 2024 and make a point on criminal justice issues that he has had an opinion on since the 2020 election when there was a disagreement in the Democratic Party about whether or not to support defunding the police or whether to be tougher on crime and continue to support police agencies. So is the president playing 2024 politics with this local Washington, D.C. issue at the expense of his longstanding, decades-long support of the so D.C. state? So what, what I'll say here is um, um, not going to get into 2024 analysis or political punditry from here. We are covered. I am covered. We are covered. Uh, by the Hatch Act, as you know, and so I'm not certainly not going to get into analysis uh, from here. Uh, I will always be very clear about what the president believes. The president believes in uh, making sure he continues to deliver for the American people. That his that is what he uh, wakes up thinking about every day, and you see that in his historic pieces of po uh, policies and laws that are now uh, in effect, and it's going to continue. That's our focus Related at this time. To this, you, a few weeks ago we talked about uh, whether or not the White House would ever swap the uh, DC license plates. Oh, yeah, and you, you said you'd get that. back to us I, on I, I still have not gotten back to you. We, I will I will work on that. I think we actually were trying to dig in and get some information. We just haven't popped any information at this time. And as he left the meeting, he said about Ohio, he was asked about East Palestine mm -hmm. and supporting legislation that's in the works. He said, I will be there soon. Is there a plan for him to go? I don't have a, any uh, trips to preview for you at this time. Uh, the president also, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, moments ago, he also talked about um, how uh, essentially this has been a priority. He's talked to uh, governors, the governor of Pennsylvania, governor of Ohio, the senators, uh, at multiple times throughout these past couple of, couple of weeks. Uh, as you know, when, it ha when uh, the derailment happened on February 3rd, uh, hours later, within hours, uh, uh, we had uh, folks on the ground from the EPA uh, making sure that we were dealing uh, with uh, this chemical spill and making sure, and since then, uh, we have had a multi-agency uh, reaction to this, an operation uh, on the ground, uh, making sure that um, uh, the community in East Palestine was getting what they needed to get back on their feet and to make them whole. And we're going to, uh, you've heard this from Secretary Buttigieg, you've heard this from uh, Administrator Regan, we are going to make sure that we hold uh, Norfolk Suffolk uh, accountable and make sure that they clean up their mess. I'm going to go to the back because I haven't done that. Uh, go ahead, Gavin. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. On the 58th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, also known as Bloody Sunday, uh, we know the President Biden will be in Selma on Sunday to give remarks. Last year, Vice President Harris gave remarks and traveled. Uh, why was it important for the President to vote this year? And so anything you can preview about his, uh, his speech, whether he'll talk about voting rights or even an uh, issue that's important to black, the black community, which is the censoring of black history. So um, I'll have more to preview uh, about uh, Sunday, hopefully tomorrow. So we'll work on that to, to make sure that we have uh, some, 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 something for all of you to preview. Look, the president w did do the march uh, back, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, back in 2019 uh, with then John, with then icon uh, leader, clearly a hero, uh, John Lewis. And he um, had an opportunity uh, to uh, go to the bridge, had an opportunity to go to, to the church uh, and do this with um, then Congressman John Lewis, as I just mentioned. And he, it was an honor for him to do that. This is someone, if you think about how the president got involved in politics, it was very much uh, connected to the civil Civil rights movement, so this is important to the president. Uh, Bloody Sunday, as we know, is a part of our history uh, that is tragic, uh, that is clearly uh, deadly, that led to, uh, uh, that helped lead to the civil rights movement getting uh, voting rights uh, done and on the books and to protect uh, a group of uh, Americans who, uh, to give them the right to make sure that they felt safe and gave them the right uh, to vote. So clearly this is something that's incredibly important. He looks forward uh, to going to, to Selma, Selma on Sunday, uh, again on a historic day that we should not forget a part of our history that we should just not forget and continue uh, continue to um, remember uh, those who fought very hard uh, for uh, for for the rights of many Americans. Another question. Um, uh, the COVID era uh, SNAP benefits expired this week. Uh, some uh, policy experts have uh, expressed concern that uh, many households, especially black and poor and minority communities, uh, will not have enough funds to uh, pay for their groceries. 
Uh, what is the White House message to those who are concerned uh, that they won't have enough funds to pay for their food? Well, this is a White House, as I've stated many times before, that uh, really cares about all Americans and making sure that no one is left behind. And we see that. We've seen that time and time again uh, in the president's, uh, you know, pieces of uh, policies and legislation. And that's what the president's going to continue to do, uh, whether it's policy that's coming out of an agency, that we are really dealing with communities that, that are dealing with a hard time, especially as we've, uh, as we've seen the last uh, three years of COVID. Uh, that's why the president passed the American Rescue Plan, to get us back on our feet, uh, to deal with, um, to deal with um, uh, uh, communities and families who are not able to put uh, food on the table or help them put food on the table, uh, making sure that our kids uh, were uh, being taken care of as as schools were closed, making sure those schools were being open. And so this is, again, from the first piece of legislation to policies coming out to different agencies that has taken this very seriously on uh, making sure that families who were hurt the hardest, uh, uh, you know, continue to get that relief. I'm just, I'm going to try and go around because I haven't, okay. Uh, my gosh. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Um, <laughs> Earlier today, Congressional Black Caucus held a presser going over their legislative agenda. And in that, Representative Horsford talked about um, a letter that was sent to DOJ wanting an update on what the administration has been doing on the executive orders that the president put out on police reform. And one thing he did say was that one of them in particular was the National Law Enforcement Account Accountability Database. That was supposed to be mm -hmm. done by January the 20th. Is there anything that you can give in an update um, about where we are in that process as the president touts, you know, goes throughout the country and he touts these, these executive orders? Mm -hmm. What is being done on that? Well, I want to take a, a step back for a second. While um, Congress was not able to deliver, on, uh, on the Policing Act, uh, as you know, that was worked in the last, uh, in the last session, uh, the President took action. He took, he took historic action to deal with an issue that was affecting communities. That has gotten support um, from civil rights leaders, that got support from uh, police unions. Uh, this was, this, the executive order that he put forward uh, was incredibly important, uh, as you know, and touted by many, uh, many, uh, many folks from both sides. Uh, so, want to make sure that is clear, that this was a historic action when Congress could not act. Uh, I don't have an update for you. Department of Justice was clearly would have more information. I know you just, you, just, uh, you just stated them. I just don't have anything to share for you at this time. Let me follow up really quickly. At the beginning of the briefing, you talked about Eli Lilly slashing the insulin prices. Is there any conversation of pressure that the President is putting on um, uh, Nordisk and Sanofi? Uh, look, the President used his bully pulpit. Uh, to make himself very clear on how we should be putting the American people first. You heard him, the, one of the reasons we saw Eli, Eli Lilly take that action is because during the State of the Union, the President put out there that uh, pharma companies need to make sure that they followed his lead as he passed it, as he helped um, sign and help tooth and nail uh, get Inflation Reduction Act passed. And because of that, we saw, uh, we saw a cap for seniors and Medi for Medicare at $35. And the President said, pharma, co farm, pharma companies should follow suit. And we saw that with Eli Lilly. So the bully pulpit that he speaks from very often and calls that out uh, is a powerful tool that we believe has been very effective. Um, I just want to seek to kind of understand the president's opposition to the bill a bit more and the reasons for it. Um, one, is it just the lowering penalties for carjackings or are there other aspects that he disagrees with? On carjackings too, is it broadly the message that would be sent by lowering the mandatory minimum? I'm looking at the bill and basically right now the minimum sentence is seven years with a maximum of 21 and the revisions would be four to 18. Does he just? Does he believe that seven years is the minimum sentence someone should receive for carjacking, or is it more so the message that would be sent here? So I'm not going to go line by line of uh, of the of the legislation. What I can say more broadly, to your point, as you are asking me this question, is that the president wants to make sure that we have communities, that communities across the country feel safe. 
Uh, he feels that this is an incredibly important for him to do as president. This is an op this is something that is being presented to him. Uh, this is not a piece of legislation that he put forward. This is something that has been presented to him, and he's going to take action on behalf of of the community here, right here in D.C. Maybe, maybe not line by line, but like just that line. No, since, I, I'm since just you I, carjacking. no no I know I I just, I, I, I just use carjacking as an example, but, but I also mentioned it in his tweet. No so. I no totally understand. I'm just not going to go line by line. It was just an easy example to give uh, to give you all and the American people how he sees this. He wants to make sure that communities feel safe uh, and this is a way that he believes uh, that we'll see that we will see that. Uh, on another area of criminal justice, um, uh, the president during the campaign uh, opposed the death penalty, said that he wanted to end it with a uh, few exceptions as well. Um, the number of people in death penalty has steadily gone up. Uh, over the past couple of years, including uh, President Biden's time in office. Does he still support ending the death penalty? And also, just where does the administration go now to actually mm -hmm. ensure that happens? Mm -hmm. As a follow to that, just also, what, what do you attribute the rise in people that have been, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, I, I said the death penalty. I um, am talking about uh, uh, solitary confinement, excuse me. Um, the number of people in solitary confinement has gone up in recent years while President Biden has been in office. He opposed solitary confinement during the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, what do you attribute the rise of people in solitary confinement during his time in office and also what steps will he take going forward? So not the death not the death okay. I was confused on that. Okay. Separate question. Okay. Uh, his his uh, policy um, uh, has not changed on this. I uh, don't have anything to preview on how to move forward or the next steps. Um, I, I cannot speak to why we've seen an, an uptick in this during his administration. Uh, clearly, that's for experts to, to follow this, to speak to. I just don't have anything further to share. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Did uh, the president talk to Mayor Bowser and tell her that he would sign this bill if it came to him, if the Senate passed it before you talked to Senate Democrats about this? Today? Yeah, I don't have any uh, call to preview. We don't have a call to preview uh, uh, with uh, with Mayor Bowser. As you know, she's the mayor of D.C., so we have a close uh, uh, close connection with her. We, my, our team here uh, speaks to her often. Uh, just don't have anything to preview as a conversation with the president or not. She's talked to people here at the White House about this legislation. I, I can't speak to this particular legislation. What I can say is that we are in regular touch with her. Uh, she is, uh, because she is right here in D.C., uh, she is, um, you know, she's here often. There's regular conversations that's had with our team here, with her team. I just don't have a, a specific conversation on this legislation to read out to you at this time. Okay. Uh, so going back to Zolan's question, uh, first question, um, the, if you're not going line by line, I guess my question is, what is it about this legislation specifically that the, is the president opposing, other than the broad concept of? of I mean, that—that's the answer. The broad, the broad. What about it, does he does he feel no, like makes DC unsafe? No, I understand. The broad concept of it is that he wants to make sure that uh, you know communities feel safe, and he feels this is a way, a step forward in doing that, and so. Look, we, you, I use the carjacking as, as an example, just as a quick example so people can understand. I'm not going to go line by line. That's not something that we tend to do here, go line by line on every piece of legislation. We tend to lift up things that make sense, things that, uh, uh, that can be easily understandable for the American people. So that's just an example that I used. But more broadly, this is a president who has led on making sure, putting forward uh, historic, uh, historic plans to make sure that Pub, there's public safety is is a priority to make sure that law enforcement uh, are able to that we have law enforcement that go into communities and make make sure communities feel safe. Uh, if you think about it, this is a president during when he was senator started the cops program, right? That is another uh, another um, kind of apparatus that he put forward to make sure that communities felt safe, uh, and that's what he's going to continue to do. Is there something besides carjackings that make people feel unsafe about this specific uh, uh, piece of legislation? What I can tell you is this is a this is a piece of legislation that the mayor objected to. The D.C. Council moved forward with on, uh, but the president feels very strongly on this. He feels that we need to make sure that all communities, including D.C., the here the folks who live in D.C., uh, feel safe, and he feels that this taking this action does exactly that. So the, the other thing I wanted to ask about was conceptually about statehood. Um, there are all kinds of instances where uh, legislatures override a governor's veto. They're at odds, but a law passes, and presumably the president doesn't feel like that. Uh, imperils their statehood. Mm -hmm. What is it in this instance that 
I'm still sort of struggling how he can support statehood for D.C. and their right to be able to pass these kinds of laws, even if he disagrees with it, but that in this instance he's deciding not to allow them that opportunity. Because this, this, this is just different. This is different, again, because the D.C. Council put these changes uh, forward over the mayor's objections. And so this is a, just a uniquely different situation that the president has been presented with and is going to take action on. If they had statehood, then the council could pass this. And, it and would that would be law. great. And that, that would be fine, right? Because the statehood would allow them to be the 51st state, and it would allow them uh, to act as their own uh, as their own entity. And the president is continuing to fight for that. He's been calling for that for the past 20 years. They don't have that yet. So this is not this is some, a, a a piece of legislation that's being presented to him, and he's going to take action on behalf on behalf of the American people, including in D.C. on, be, on behalf of keeping the public safe, including in D.C. And that's what you're seeing the president do. But doesn't mean he's not going to call on uh, making sure that uh, uh, D.C. is indeed a statehood. So this again, this has been presented to him. He's going to take action on behalf of the American people. But of course, he wants to make sure uh, that D.C. does have statehood, as he's been calling for for decades. Go ahead. Thanks, Karine. Um, I know you say you don't want to get ahead of the president's budget release <laughs> next week, but does the president believe that there is reckless spending in the federal government that needs to be addressed? I'm so let me first say that this is a president for the first two years who has put policies forth that has lowered the deficit by $1.7 trillion. So he's taken that very seriously to make sure that we continue to do that work. And he talked about it during the State of the Union, I just mentioned it, uh, that he's going to cut the deficit by more than $2 trillion over 10 years by asking the wealthy and the big corporations to pay their fair share. And he's going to do that without cutting programs Americans have paid into. If you think about Social Security, think about uh, Medicare, something that Republicans continue to say or have said and have said uh, for years now they want it uh, they want to cut so the president's going to continue to fight for those important pieces uh, of um, uh, important programs and so what the president is also going to focus on is continuing to lower costs uh, for families that's what he's going to do I'm not going to get ahead of his uh, of his budget it's going to come out a week from today and you all will get to see it we're going to continue to ask uh, Republicans to do the same to put forth a budget to see a put forth a budget that's fiscally responsible uh, and that lays out for the American people a transparent budget so we can see what is it that they're calling on what is it that they're calling for uh, in their budget real quick you know some fact checkers believe that that 1.7 trillion was because the COVID relief funds ran out Do, does the White House have a response to that what we know and what we have seen from the data is because of this president because of the plans that he has put forward 1.7 trillion dollars that's what we've seen in the last two years that's how the deficit has uh, has uh, decreased and that's important uh, and uh, again the president is committed for the next 10 years to do uh, to to bring down the deficit by two trillion dollars and so that is the commitment that this president's going to have Student you mentioned to Peter that your message to borrowers right now would be that you have their back. But if you're one of 40 million Americans whose now financial fate is up in the air essentially, don't they deserve to know if having their back means that there's an actual backup plan in the works? Or if it's simply that you know you feel that, that the way that you've gone about this now is your best shot at this, do they deserve to know that too? What I can tell you is yes, we have their backs. That's why the Secretary on the same day uh, of the arguments uh, made sure that we sent out an, uh, an email to millions of borrowers to let them know that. We will have their backs and the president will continue to do so. We are, again, confident in our legal authority, as the president said yesterday, as I said yesterday as well, as I'm saying to all of you, in our, uh, in our, legal, uh, uh, you know, in our legal argument here. We think uh, the SG, she did a fantastic job uh, defending the president's program, uh, the president's plan. And so, again, we're going to see how this plays out. We're certainly not going to get ahead of uh, the Supreme Court and what they decide. Uh, but again, we feel that they do not have, the other side do not have uh, the merit uh, to, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to really a merit to, to stand for, with their argument. They truly don't. And so we're going to continue to uh, make a forceful uh, defense uh, for the president's program. It is unfortunate that folks on the other side, you have elected officials who do not want to protect or give a little bit of a breathing room to those 40 million Americans that will get that. Let's not forget 90 percent of folks in the that's going to be be able to participate in the president's plan are making less than $75,000. So 
it sounds like plan B is plan A, right? And so I just, to just be really practical about it, do borrowers need to be making other plans? That is not for me uh, to speak to. What I can tell you what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to continue to defend uh, the president's plan. We believe we have the legal authority uh, to, uh, to, to be successful here. The Solicitor General proved that, showed that yesterday. That's what we believe. And our plan uh, is a good plan. It's a very good plan that's going to give relief, again, to wor uh, working families, to middle class Americans. And so that's what we're going to continue to fight for. And not to beat a dead horse on, on the D.C. crime bill, but I think there just still is some confusion here because given the difference between the SAP that came out earlier last month and the announcement today, what led to this change of heart? Because it does seem there was a change of heart. Look, what I can tell you is what the president said himself, and just repeat that, which is he, uh, he, uh, you know, he believes in every city uh, has the right to self-government. Government that never changes. He's been saying that for some time. And if the Senate uh, uh, sends the bill, this particular bill, to his desk, he will sign it. And he said that today. I'm repeating it from the podium. Uh, and he believes, uh, you know, this is a way for him to keep. Uh, the community uh, safe in D.C. and the people of D.C. safe, the residents of D.C. Uh, safe and protected. So that is why he's moving forward so in this way. Changing his mindset between February 6th and today. I'm just I'm just laying out where the president is today, as this is coming. Uh, this is going to be coming before him, uh, and he's going to sign it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.